Joining me is Ronan Hessian, uh, another one of the shortlisted authors uh, for this year's Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year for Leonard and Hungry Paul. Ronan, thanks many for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rick. Not, not, not even slightly. Um, tell me about how the last maybe four weeks, five weeks has affected you and your work. That's a question for, for authors usually, but obviously you're in that unusual position of you also at the moment still have a day job as well. Yeah, that's right. So I, I work full time as a civil servant. So my writing world is built around that and I have young children. Uh, but I've always had a creative life outside of work. You know, I was involved in music for a very long time. Uh, so I've always had a sort of secret superhero existence. Uh, which has just moved from music to writing in the last kind of couple of years. And the last few weeks, I've, um, I've just been doing a lot of reading. I've just finished work on my second book and in the sort of interval between submitting it and getting into writing uh, in earnest, uh, I just was able to sit back, uh, read, decompress from that. And I've also done a short piece of fiction, which uh, will be out next month. Okay. Tell us, for those people who haven't yet read Leonard and a Hungry Paul, what the book is about. Well, I, the the description I find that conveys it most easily is to say it's a book about gentle people. Uh, we know what confident people think about the world and about themselves because they tell us. Uh, but I really wanted to explore the people who are unsure of themselves and unsure of how they relate to the world. Uh, and I began to wonder, what do the quiet people, the people who are overlooked, what do they have to offer? maybe they offer the thing that's missing when we all puzzle about the world and it's really an exploration of that it is kind of an, an underdeveloped area in fiction and as you as you said yourself the world is not shy of people who put themselves you know front and center or people who are heroes or but you know both leonard and and hungry paul they in those kind of books they would be supporting characters at best yeah i think I think there's a tendency in fiction to shy away from characters like that because we, we like drama uh, and I think the tendency is towards to find a central conflict to work around. So it was a nice challenge for me not just to put characters like that at the centre but to try and make a story of it. So I think what the key there is to focus on human nature and how, how people in a steady state and in their case they're quite set in their ways so it's a very steady state when that gets shaken up, how they adapt to change and how they find a new sort of equilibrium. Uh, and that, that's really what, what drives the book. So it's a book, rather than following an arc as such, I like to think it's sort of, it's sort of flowers. Maybe and maybe tell us a little bit about, uh, about both Leonard and Hungry Paul, uh, about them as characters and about, about who they are and, and what they do. Sure, well, well Leonard, Leonard is a man in his early 30s, uh, his father died uh, during child childbirth. So he, he has lived with his mother all his adult life. And he's a ghostwriter for children's encyclopedias. And he, in a way, has never lost the wonder that he had as a child. But his life uh, shrinks. He finds over time that his range of experience, and he can feel his personality shrinking, uh, particularly when his mother passes away. And that's not much of a spoiler because it happens on the third page. Uh, and he notices that change in himself. And his friend is Hungry Paul. And Hungry Paul likewise lives at home with his parents, quite happily in fact. And he's a very self-contained person. He has a certain uh, mental stillness, to, almost to the point of obliviousness. And the two of them share a curiosity about the world. And they have quite a, they try to figure out the world for themselves. Uh, and as a result, their take is quite idiosyncratic uh, without, I hope, being too much of a novelty. And for Hungry Paul, his family is going through change. His sister is going to get married, his parents are getting older, and they're looking to the next phase in their lives. And so that change is going on around him. And so for both of them, they're making this transition between having a very set life or living in a bubble, and then realizing for the first time in their lives that a bubble can never protect you because the things around you will change. It's also, and one of the things I, I like most about the book as well, is that it, it's a book about something that exists in real life everywhere, but isn't really written about a lot. And that's 
it's a, a gentle friendship between two men in their 30s in which there is not an awful lot of drama. You know, that happens in reality all the time, but it tends not to be the subject of novels. That's right. And I think, I think partly where that came from was I'd, I'd come out of almost a decade of reading children's books, uh, reading books to my, to my own kids and seeing how they worked and really connecting back to the way we first learn stories. You know, in Ireland, the, the first thing you learn in school is creative writing. You learn it in, in your first three years in school. In fact, it's the dominant thing you study and you practice in your homework and then it stops. Uh, and I think one thing that I was reconnected with is the way in which children uh, are encouraged to use their imaginations. Uh, and in a way we forget that training. So I wanted to revisit that that sort of sense of wonder uh, without the characters being, uh, you know, some form of man-child. Yeah, it, it, uh, I'm interested as well in that the book has cast, you know, a huge footprint since, since it came out, but it's been published by, by quite a small publisher, by, by Blue Moose uh, in the UK. Maybe tell me how, how that came about, how you ended up with them. Well, when I, when I was writing the book, I, I really didn't think it would be published, uh, not for any sort of self-deprecating reason, because I did believe in it as a, as a piece of work. I just didn't see how it would survive the, the elevator pitch nature of publishing. Uh, and while I was working on it, I came across a book called uh, Man with a Seagull on His Head by an English writer called Harriet Page. Uh, and I felt that that was from a similar universe, or at least it felt like that to me. And that was the first time I came across Blue Moose. And I began to learn more about how they, how they work. So they, it's a husband and wife team. They remortgaged their house 10 years ago to start the publisher. Uh, my, my editor is the publisher's mother-in-law. She's a 73-year-old retired professional wrestler. Uh, and they, they work. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to scroll you back there. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm not going to let you just slide that one on, <laughs> under, under the... Your editor is a 73-year-old former professional wrestler. How did that come about? So her name is Lynn Webb uh, and Kevin Duffy, who, who runs Blue Moose with, with Heather, his wife. She's Heather's mother and she's the chief editor at Blue Moose. So she, it's a good combination uh, because wrestlers are used to getting out of tight situations and they're also don't take any messing. So in terms of personality traits for an editor, she has a lot going. And we have a very, very good relationship. Blue Moose give me complete freedom, but the price for that is, is you need to have a, a challenging uh, editor in your corner. So they were the first publisher I sent it to. I, I, I sent it to Kevin on like Friday, midnight on a Friday, and he gets up early and walks his dogs. So um, he got back to me like 7 a.m. the next morning. I'd sent him three chapters. He said, send me the rest of it. And about a week or so later, he put something on Twitter saying, I've just read this manuscript, can't wait to tell the world about it. And he had a line from, from Leonard Hungry Paul. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> So I rang my, my wife and told her, uh, and then I went to a bookshop to calm down on my lunch break and got this lovely email where he told me what he liked about the book. And within a couple of days, uh, we'd signed a contract and I'm doing two more books with him as well. Tell me at that stage what your aspiration was for the book, because you've already said yourself, you, you didn't think it was ever going to necessarily be published because it's not the sort of thing that it's easy to, to, to pitch. A publisher then says, we love this and, we, and we'd like to do this. At that stage, wh where do you think the book is going to end up? I honestly thought that because I was an Irish writer, their first Irish writer they'd worked with uh, on a small UK publisher, that the Irish scene would see me as a UK author and the UK scene would see me as an Irish author. And I thought I might fall between the cracks. Uh, and I, but my ambition for the book was to, for it to do well enough that I got to do a second book. Uh, and that's, that's really, I, I, I felt that it would, it would be something I'd kind of reveal to people that I, that I wrote books, uh, you know, uh, if I was asked or if it came up, but I didn't really think it would reach an audience or in any sort of way uh, have a personality of its own. Uh, and I, I knew the risks. I'd seen books that came out just before mine who were, that were really good and just came out and didn't have a very long life. And it is, it is quite unpredictable how that works. You, you talked just there very briefly about, about your kind of secret identity before all of this. You were not only a, a songwriter and a performer, but quite a successful one as well. You were nominated for the Choice Prize at one stage. Um, what was the transition like 
between being a songwriter, being a performer, having a band, and then attempting to tell stories in a completely different way? It, what, what I realized is that uh, creativity is, and, and your imagination, uh, it's not an elective thing. It works based on its own principles, which are not really knowable. So in about 2012, after my last album, you know, we got nominated for the Choice Prize. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done three albums at that stage. I've been around for a long time. And I thought I was finished with creativity. I was, you know, physically, mentally exhausted. Uh, and I felt creatively satisfied. And then I realized, it took me about five years from there to realize that your creativity is like your sense of humor. It, it doesn't go away. You know, you don't decide, I'm suddenly, I'm too busy to have a sense of humor. And I began to get lots of flashes. Uh, and I realized I was effectively pregnant with Leonard. Uh, and I just felt this buildup of energy. And that's still the way it works. Whenever I get an idea for a story, it's flashes of scenarios. People, they, they start to materialize uh, and as if they're seeking form. So I never thought I would write, because songwriting is about boiling things down. I never thought I would write something as expansive as a paragraph. So I can trace it back in my life. A lot of my working life involves writing and editing. But I sat down really just to find out about Leonard. I said, I'm going to write about him every day. I had a new diary because it was like February. And I said, I'm going to get this lovely new diary and I'm going to fill out a page a day about Leonard. And by the second day, I said, okay, forget it. I'm just going to write a novel. And I hit 10,000 10, words pretty quickly. And people have told me that, that that's a sort of key milestone. If you still have energy at 10,000, um, keep going. And so that's what I did. I didn't plot the book particularly. I always knew what was going to happen next. And I had a general sense of how much mileage it had. What was your writing routine like at the time? Because particularly you, being somebody who hadn't had a novel published at that point and you, you have a full-time job and you have a, a, a family, where, where were you finding the space to, to squeeze all of that in? I, I, wrote, I wrote the first uh, draft in three months. I, I wrote it six nights a week. Uh, so I would put my kids to bed and then about 10 o'clock, I'd flip open the laptop and I'd work till midnight or about half 12. And I would do that six nights a week for three months. Uh, and I wrote the first draft that way. And what I liked about that was that I would, whatever chapter I was working on that evening, I would carry around for the day. So whatever sort of scenario was there, was able to sort of, I'd have an idea that it was going to be about a particular setting. I, I, the, the, the chapters are very much vignettes and they're, they're almost like film scenes. Uh, so I had that scene in my head and I would just pilfer whatever happened that day. And I wrote it on my kitchen table, surrounded by board games, surrounded by children's encyclopedias, and just really used whatever was lying around. Uh, but even when I finished the book, I, like, I went after writing it for three months, I then took a month off, then I would do two or three months editing and a month off. So I took another six or eight months of editing. And then after I submitted it, another about three or four months of editing. So the editing is really where the, the characters get depth, uh, the connections get tighter, and it starts to feel like a world. At this stage, uh, obviously, we're talking about it being one of the, the shortlisted books earlier this year for the, the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year for, for Writers Week. It was nominated for, for Novel of the Year in, in Dalkey. You were nominated for a British Book Award. Uh, this book has punched well, well, well above what you might have considered to have been its weight, given the nature of, of the size of the publisher and the kind of the, the, the small beginning. Absolutely. It's Boomus' biggest ever seller, actually. And uh, that the marketing budget was somewhere between 50p and a pound. So, so it, 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 the, the only real marketing spend was getting proofs done. Uh, and they were done early, which meant it, was, it could be in people's slush piles for a period of time that had some hope of getting to the top. Uh, and it's just, it's just, it, it's had its champions as well. You, you've been a great champion of the book, you know, Kit Deval, a great champion, BBC put on their book club. And also a lot of people who read are quiet, gentle people. A lot of people who work in libraries, who work in bookshops. Uh, and just as you said earlier, there aren't that many books about people like that. I think to some extent it found its tribe and its tribe were among book lovers. So, we, you know, we talk about, you know, coronavirus flattening the curve. Uh, indie publishers have been flattening the curve for years. So it's not one big media splash in your hope. So it's over time. It just keep like the book is out over a year and it's still a daily occurrence for somebody to get in contact with you about the book or as people discover it. 
uh, and that's been a really beautiful part of it. And it's 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 stayed at a manageable level, so I can interact with people and I can, you know, enjoy the experience as opposed to it being a big marketing hustle that I have to kind of, you know, uh, wade my way through. So so I really enjoyed the way it's unfolded in the world, and I think the way the book has gone in terms of sales or or you know finding its readers is really in the spirit of the book itself. I don't, I don't think a book like this would work with a pushy. Uh, you know, campaign. It, it's 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 a gentle book. It's a non-competitive book, uh, and and it's made its way that way. Do, do you think, in some way, that as a as a debut author, though, you've been almost robbed of what would have been your first festival season? You would have been at this stage in any other year. You would have been doing festivals around the country, possibly internationally as well. You would have been out there meeting readers, meeting other authors. Does it, does it seem like a strange experience or because you don't really know what that feels like, do, do, you, do you just think, well, that's just the way it is? Oh, I, I'm completely stoic about it. The, the way I, I, my background in music was very much an in independent music. And although the music I made was kind of storytelling music, I always liked the punk ethic. I like the spontaneity of doing Zoom events. I like the fact that People will send me a message on Twitter and say, my book club is discussing your book tonight. Can you join us? And I'll do it. You know, it'll be no problem. Uh, and I like the way that it's completely democratic and there's nobody in charge of the Zoom world. So uh, people can just do it. Uh, and that kind of guerrilla sort of style of enjoyment of books and literature to me is shrinking the distance between writers and, and people who read. Uh, I've, I've done a few festivals. I've done some big festivals. Uh, and it is very much a stage versus audience situation. And I think that it gets leveled out uh, on the online festival. So that's so why I like them. And I hope they stay around. And I think they, they'll become an, an extra part of the future festival world. I don't think they'll displace festivals, but I do think they'll, they'll, they'll enrich it for some people. Yeah, I think they will too. Just maybe finally, before we finish, what's uh, happening next? Are you the sort of person who feels comfortable about talking about the next book? Or do you have that completely under wraps? I can say a little bit about it. Um, you know, Leonard and Hungry Paul is, is out in the US in, in August. Uh, Melville House are publishing that. So um, that's the, the immediate next thing. The next book is a book called Panenka. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very different style of book to Leonard and Hungry Paul, a very different feel. Uh, I describe it in two different ways. One is that it's a, it's a redemption story about headaches. Another way I can describe it is as a platonic love story. So it's both those things. Uh, I think I, I, while it's quite a different book, a quite different feel, I do think it still has the same focus on human nature, family, and understanding the vulnerable sides of human nature. And when is that out? That May next year. May of next year, it's too far away. Ronan Hessian, the author of Leonard and Hungry Paul, thanks a million for talking to us. Thank you, Rick, thanks for having me.